Hey, Nexus. Hey, Instagram. Um, I'm Google recording again. And you would think that by like nine episodes in, I would have the hang of this where I would know like how to set up my camera so I can look at two cameras at once, but I haven't freaking figured it out yet. So I'm going to be looking at whatever camera is the most interactive. Um, and I hope we can hang out. Hattie, what's up? Um, stoked to be here. Um, Harvest is an exciting and nerve wracking time of year. Um, and we're going to try and, hey Jenny, um, we're going to try and demystify some of the terms around grape harvest. So, um, you can harvest a lot of things. Hey, um, can you guys do me a favor? Sorry, I hate, I just use the word guys. That's very exclusive. Um, can you lovely, rad people. Um, leave me your actual name in the Instagram live so I can call you by name because I have a, I'm awful at pronouncing handles. Um, and so um, if I knew your name, that'd be really rad and would make this much more um, personable and less like I'm talking to a bunch of handles because you guys aren't handles, you're people. Ah! Um, but today we are talking about harvest. Um, and harvest is a thing that happens in the Northern hemisphere every year around Jonas. Okay. I'm going to write, I'm going to write these names down. So we got Jenny and we got Jonas. Um, Jonas is, Oh, okay. My name is Jenny. My handle is super creative. <laughs> um, Jimmy Waldron. I'm going to assume is Jimmy. I hope. Um, uh, I don't know. Let me know if I'm wrong, but um, harvest is something that happens in the Northern hemisphere every fall ish depending on how you categorize fall and that's going to take you from as early as early august and super hot years to end of november maybe even december if you're harvesting what are called dessert wines or ice wines um oh hey amy um hey katie um so if your name isn't obvious in your handle please let me know what okay jimmy awesome jimmy Please let me know what your actual like English name is and not your Instagram name. So I know what, how, how to like refer to you. Cause I'm just going to slaughter Instagram handles. It's without a, without a doubt. So the first really important decision that, um, a winemaking team is going to make around harvest is when do you harvest? So that sounds kind of silly. Like you harvest when the grapes are ripe. Right. But remember that, um, every grape is going to have a different rate at which it ripens. And so it has a different growing season. Just like if you went to the store and you've ever like a, like a feed store or a place where you go buy seeds for plants and you look at like the 20 different kinds of kale that they possibly could have there. Um, and this kale grows in 54 days and this kale grows in 63 days. Um, the same thing applies to grapes. And so not every grape is going to ripen at the same rate. And so we'll use some extreme examples. Um, typically a really early ripening grape is going to be Pinot. So Pinot Noir is a grape that's grown all over the world. Um, it's a very thin skinned grape and it has a um, very short growing span from, um, from flowering or from berries to harvest. That, that period is pretty short. Um, and so if we were to decide if we wanted to harvest some Pinot, we're going to measure two things. We're going to measure, well, we're going to measure a few things, but some of the biggest things we're going to measure are titratable acidity. So how much acid is in the grapes overall. And then we're going to measure bricks or sugar content. And so, um, and so, as a winemaker, or as I'm, I'm not a winemaker, remember, I am not a winemaker, I'm enologist. So as um, a member of a winemaking team, we might go out into the vineyard and we're gonna pick grapes all across the vineyard. Because remember too, that a lot, oftentimes these vineyards aren't flat plots of land that you just plop fruit into. Um, there's hills and there's valleys and there's rows and, and there's slopes and certain slopes face different ways. And so in order to sample an entire vineyard, depending, I mean, which, which is a pain in the sometimes, you have to walk around the entire vineyard and pick a cluster from each different area. South facing slope, east facing slope, west facing slope, the valleys, the hills, all that stuff. 
you take that into your winery and you literally just have a Ziploc bag usually of grape clusters from all over your vineyard and you smush it. Um, and the process of smushing it uh, releases all of the juice that's in the grapes. And then from there you can do, it's, it's a titration. Has anybody ever done like a general chemistry titration where you titrate sodium hydroxide solution into an acidic solution and see the inflection point? That's exactly what we do in the lab. So, um, and we measure the titratable acidities that way. So we're looking for fairly high titratable acidities, fairly low pHs. Um, you're looking for pHs anywhere from 2.9 to about 3.2 for the example we're using right now, which is Pinot Noir, um, because that pH is gonna increase as a function of fermentation, which we can talk about in a little bit. Um, every plant has different growing rates, preferences among varieties. The preferences that you pick, that's, so that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. The preferences that you're gonna pick as a wine maker are going to be very dependent on the region that you're growing them in. So if you are in a very cool climate, you're not going to want things that are going to need a very long growing period because odds are you're gonna have a real fall and a real winter. Um, I mean, that's not always true, right? There's there's places in Washington state, for example, and Bordeaux, for example, that have very real falls and winters. And they just have a really freaking hot summer, but you have to look at your microclimate as a function and ask yourself what varieties with their growing season are best suited for my area. So that's how you sort of decide um, what grapes you want to bring in. Um, but I would actually argue that, that that's even more of um, a viticulturist decision. So someone who grows grapes, those are things that they have to think about. Winemakers have to think about where can I get the best fruit? And then the viticulturist says the best fruit for this region is this. Um, so in the example of Pinot, let's say we took our, we went around, we walked around our little vineyard that has a bunch of different facing slopes. And we took a bunch of different samples of clusters that are all over the vineyard. Um, we smushed them in our little Ziploc bag. We measured our TAs, our titratable acidities and our bricks or our percent sugar. So it's a function of density. It's a very rough estimation of how much glucose and fructose content is actually in that sample, but it's good enough for government work. So let's say we get some numbers that are like, I don't know, your pH is at like 2.9 and your bricks are at like 23. I don't know. I'm, I'm making these numbers up. I mean, they're close, but I, this is not real data that I had, right? Um, we might say, okay, sounds great. That is the first decision that a winemaker is going to make around harvest. Um, and that's going to be, again, a function of what variety you're harvesting and where you, where you live and where you grow your grapes. Um, oh, hey, CSA. Howdy. I it's been, been a while. Hi, Kyle. Um, again, if your handle doesn't look like your name, please let me know what your name is so I can write it down here and actually call, like, ask you questions by name if you ask me questions because I hate when I like mispronounce a handle and I just slaughter it, um, which happens all the time. So what does harvest actually physically look like? <laughs> actually, this is a good question. What do you think harvest looks like? Because a lot of people have this like super romantic idea in their head of like walking through the vineyard and, and it is actually kind of romantic sometimes, but um, you know, walking through the vineyard at dusk and dawn and whatever. So the next question you have to ask yourself is, <laughs> as soon as like, I'm making these numbers up, mm -hmm. truth. So the next question you have to ask yourself during harvest is what temperature do I want to harvest my grapes at? And that matters. Usually that matters. I mean, I don't, I hate the word usually, but I'm sorry, I just said it. Um, this oftentimes matters. Michelle. Okay. Awesome. I've been wondering what your name is. Okay. Michelle. Where are you from, Michelle? Are you from Washington? Um, okay. So the next decision you have to make is what temperature do you want your grapes to come into the cellar or the winemaking facility? Because if your grapes are coming in really hot and you don't have time to deal with them right now, they very well may start either fermenting or going through a process called carbonic maceration that we're going to talk about later. So a lot of times you're harvesting grapes at the crack of dawn. So a lot of people will start harvesting at like four in the morning or depending on how cool that day was 10 o'clock at night um, or even midnight depending because those times of day are going to be the coldest which allows the winemaker or the winemaking team to have the most control over that fermentation. It's easy to heat it up 
it's harder to cool it down. Um, you can put dry ice on a bin and kind of control the temperature of a bin that way. But you don't really want to have to do that if you can just bring in fruit that's a little bit colder. So um, that's the next decision. So you have harvest date when you're going to pick it, which is a function of pH and sugar usually. And then what temperature are you going to pick it at? And um, you usually take out what are called <laughs> FYBs. Um, I'm going to swear. I'm sorry. But FYBs are very common in the wine industry. And they're called fucking yellow bins. I cannot make this up. Um, <laughs> they're, they're like just the right size to go down a row, snip, snip, snip all of your clusters off. We harvest by hand. Um, not everybody does. You can also machine harvest, but if you're harvesting by hand, you're going to have bins of some sort and FYBs are the most common bins. And then you haul your little bins up and you walk up the hill. It's a, ser it's a serious workout because again, remember like a lot of these vineyards are sloped, like steep slopes, like five to 25% slope you're gonna get a workout in. Um, and you carry them up to a bigger bin and these bins for small to moderate size wineries are gonna be about a thousand pounds when they're filled up, so about a ton. Um, yeah, oh my God, my sweet virgin ears. Can you make ice wine with liquid nitrogen? Oh my gosh, that is a great question. I'm gonna write that down and answer that a little bit later when we talk about um, uh, other methods. So sorry, ice wine liquid nitrogen. I'm going to say right now, I have never heard of anybody doing that, but I would not, it's not impossible. Actually, no, it is impossible. It's very unlikely. Um, and I'll, I'll address that in a second. Sorry. So, um, so you take your, you take your, your little bins, your FYBs, and you dump them into your big bins, which are about a ton. And then you truck those to the winery. That is the actual physical harvest. Now the whole thing is called harvest. Every, everything from bringing in fruit to fruit juice that's fermenting into wine. You may also hear it uh, referred to as the crush. So um, the crush and harvest are sometimes used interchangeably, but they basically mean this period in time when you're bringing in fruit and actively making wine, which is happening right now in the Northern Hemisphere. Let's do a side community wine, <laughs> hydroponics with liquid nitrogen. <laughs> That's rad. Um, so once you have, let's say we have our fruit in the winery. We, we just harvested Pinot. Let's say we stick, we'll stick to our, our Pinot example here because it's one of the first things to ripen in most areas, but not all areas. Um, and now we have a process called sorting. So you can sort a couple of ways. So you can physically just sort in the vineyard. And what I mean by sorting is picking out the fruit that you want to keep. So um, I'm sure you've all have heard like horror stories of like people having to get like lizards or birds or whatever out of grape bins before they put it into a fermentation tank or whatever. Um, that's typically a problem with machine harvesting because if you can if you can imagine um, in a lot of bigger vineyards and bigger wine growing areas, they design their rows in such a way that they are the width of a certain tractor that can drive through that row and just like you can't see me, but pretend like I have little like tractor claws, right? Um, these claws that just like kind of pick off grapes and they also get leaves and stems and shoots and all that stuff. Um, so in the process of machine harvesting, it's very important to do what's called sorting. And so you'll have a sorting table that is just, it's, it's, it's like um, the belts that your groceries go on at the grocery store kind of. And you'll have people sitting around that table just picking stuff out. So that's, that's what a sorting table is called. And that's where you pick out your best fruit. You can also sort just in the vineyard by very selectively picking exactly what clusters you want to throw into your, into your one ton bin. Um, and sorting is very important too, because as, you know, as, as hard as you and your viticulture manager might try to have every single grape ripen at the same evenness at the same time, that's probably not going to happen. Um, you're probably going to get some underripe grapes and you're probably going to get some grapes that are raisinated. And so it's up to the winemaker to decide if he or she or they want to keep those under or overripe grapes. But um, that's part of the sorting process as well. And you also have to remove some leaves. Leaves happen. Does harvesting by hand help to reduce the potential for unwanted heat as opposed to maybe getting heat from the machinery? That is a really great question. Um, I don't think that the heat is going to come from the actual machine itself. 
Um, and I think there is a little bit of, a, a bit of benefit as well to the fact that a lot of machine harvesting is also done at night when it's really flipping cold. Um, but I, I don't expect that to be an issue. If you look at videos, excuse me, um, if you look at videos of these tractors doing machine harvesting, um, they, they're basically just like pulling it off and throwing it right into the bin. And so that's not, that's not a lot of kinetic energy. And as soon as that grape is just sitting there it's, or that cluster is sitting there, it's kind of done. Um, I'm totally using Raisinated to describe other things in life now. <laughs> Pretty flippin' accurate. Um, so sorting. So you can sort on a sorting table and you might do that after machine harvesting. You can sort in the vineyard by being really picky with the grapes that you choose. Um, and that's another really important step in the harvest. So we will imagine a scenario where we decided to pick our Pinot because we are in an area where Pinot grows really well. And we um, took our, our FYBs and we threw them in our bin and we sorted through them in the vineyard because um, we are a small to medium sized winery. And now we have to ask ourselves what we want to do with that Pinot. And Pinot is actually a really good example for all of these winemaking decisions that I'm going to talk about because Pinot as a varietal very commonly undergoes a whole bunch of different treatments. So um, the wine that I'm drinking tonight is Pinot. Um, I chose it specifically. It was 95% whole cluster, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, and Pinot as a berry is a very thin skinned berry. It's a very small berry. Um, and as a consequence, if you want to get a really robust, what's called a tannic profile out of Pinot Noir, you sometimes have to kind of work with it a little bit. So tannins, as we have mentioned before on this, on this show, Evenings of Enology, tannins are long chain polyphenols that provide a sense of astringency and dryness onto your palate. So these tannins are in the seeds, the skins, and the stems of grapes. That being said, we recall that Pinot is a very thin skin varietal and the tannin composition of a Pinot that doesn't undergo a couple of different processes is therefore going to be kind of flat and it's not going to stand up to the very high acid profile that Pinot typically has. And so Pinot is going to undergo like a whole bunch of stuff. Um, come visit me in Oregon. We have Pinot plenty. Yes, you do. One of my favorite wines of my entire life was a 2009 Willamette Pinot from, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. And I knew I was going to do it as soon as I said it. Anyway, this one wine, William Selim? No, it wasn't William Selim. Close. It was like William Selim though. Um, and it smelled like mushrooms and dried earth and leather and like brandy cherries. It was beautiful. I wanted to be buried in it. It was gorgeous. Um, Okay, sorry, Keelan's brain is back on tannins now. So um, so Pinot as a varietal, again, is very low tannin. So we have to ask ourselves, what kind of things can we do to, um, to make Pinot more robust in its tannin profile? And so one thing you can do is called a pre-fermentative cold soak. Let that sink in for a second. Um, and these are kind of cool. So pre-fermentative means before the onset of alcoholic fermentation. So there are certain things in wines that are going to be soluble in ethanol and certain things that are going to be soluble in water. And so one thing you can do, and, and I'm going to give a couple of examples of things that you can do as a winemaker to make decisions, but that doesn't mean you do all of these things at once, right? That means you can do one of these things, two of these things, none of these things. Um, but these are all things that you can work with as a winemaking team to make decisions when your fruit comes in. So um, a pre-fermentative cold soak can be anywhere from two to 10 days. You know, it's a very flexible time frame and anywhere from five to about 15 degrees Celsius. And this can be chilled in a number of ways. This can be chilled by the addition of dry ice. This can be chilled by the addition of what's called like a glycol chiller. So you can have tanks where you just throw stuff in and glycol goes around the tank and keeps things really cold. Um, there's a number of ways to keep things cold, but the goal is to keep it, you know, below 15 degrees Celsius for sure for a certain amount of time. And what that does is we've, we've mentioned before on this podcast or podcast, Kayleen, we've mentioned before on this show that there are, um, monomeric polyphenols called anthocyanins and flavin three alls and anthocyanins contribute to color 
and flavin three alls contribute to um, a little bit of astringency and bitterness and also um, a, a few other things. They, they are building blocks of long chain tannins. So those things are soluble in water, not in ethanol. And so if you want to boost your tannic profile or your polyphenolic is actually a better term, your polyphenolic profile, um, a thing you can do, just, just let it sit in juice for a couple of days. And because that temperature is so low, you're going to be getting extraction just because you're sitting there as a function of time, but the yeast aren't super active at that temperature. It's a, it's a, it's, it's not the best temperature. Yeast like to ferment around 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you drop that temperature really, really low and they can't do anything, you can still extract water soluble compounds or your polyphenolic water soluble compounds and increase the profile of color, increase the polyphen or sorry, increase the monophenolic character of that Pinot. Um, and you can also get a higher seed tannin contribution. So seed tannins are a lot smaller in length than skin tannins. And so um, they are also more soluble in water. And those seed tannins can sometimes be a little astringent and off-putting, but seed tannins do also contribute a few other flavors as um, flavors and building blocks to wine that are really nice to work with with Pinot. And so if I was a winemaker and I got my fruit in and my pH was great and my bricks were great, my TA looked fantastic, um, but I still didn't get the ripeness that I wanted. And if I were to leave it on the vine for too long, I could I could run a, you know, the, the gauntlet of issues, right? I could maybe get rain. I could get botrytis. I could get um, a handful of things or it would just be overripe and flat and flabby. I may consider doing a pre-fermentative cold soak to kind of um, extract some of those monomeric polyphenolic or sorry, monomeric phenolic compounds um, such as anthocyanins or flavin alls. So that's pre-fermentative cold soaking. Another thing um, we need to talk about as far as just terms are concerned is what it means to press a wine. So you'll hear people say, oh, we're going to press off our whatever. We whole cluster press. We, we, you know, bladder press. We whatever press. Pressing, all pressing really means is it's, it's basically like a strainer that's under pressure. And so you can separate the juice from the stems, the seeds, the skins, whatever. So if I have destemmed my fruit, so I don't want any contribution of the stems at all in my final wine because stems, as we're going to mention later, stems on a cluster do contribute to some pretty severe polyphenolic or tannic character of wines. If I already have a really tannic varietal, like Syrah, for example, Syrah has a, a very large skin to flesh ratio and that skin is really thick um, and very heavy in anthocyanins and tannins. It does you no good. Well, that's not true. That's a bad example, actually. Um, we'll say sometimes it does you little good to have stem addition, although, or whole cluster fermentation, although we'll mention later, um, you can also do partial whole cluster or partial stem addition. But um, let's say I have destemmed my varietal and I am putting it into a press. That basically just means that I am squishing all my little grapes together under pressure and juice is coming out. So we'll use maybe Chardonnay for an example. Um, and let's say we're going to do part of our Chardonnay whole cluster press and part of our Chardonnay uh, destemmed press. So what does that look like from a practical perspective? From a practical perspective, that looks like, I mean, I wish I, wish I could draw, but I can't. Um, from a practical perspective, that looks like, remember those one ton bins we talked about? You take your FYBs and you throw your grapes into the one ton bin. Those one ton bins in a lot of wineries and a lot of small to medium sized wineries are designed to fit on a forklift. And that forklift is gonna lift up that one ton bin. It's gonna dump it into basically a funnel. And that funnel is going to put all of those grapes into a press of some sort. If it's whole cluster, you can only fit in half the fruit. Sucks. Takes forever. So, because remember, stems take up space. Wah, wah, wah. So, um, we're going to dump the berries, the stems, the everything in there and just press it very slowly. Or we're going to destem it and put it into the same press. All that means, though, is pressing is the process of getting juice away from stems, skins, seeds. You can press 
before or after fermentation. Are you confused yet? So if we do what's called, and we'll talk about this later, a whole cluster fermentation, that means in your little bin, you've got berries, stems, skins, whatever, and you're gonna let it ferment like that until it's dry. So now you're at a point maybe where you need to press off fermented wine. You can press off juice. You can also press off wine. So when I say, I mean, these two words sound kind of like, Kayleen, what's the thing? But it's really important, right? So um, <laughs> pre-wine or juice can be pressed just like wine can be pressed. Um, but that's what pressing means. Okay, I literally like wrote down my like, pseudo lesson plan. So I'm referring to an actual lesson plan that I have here. Um, okay, whole cluster press. We kind of just touched on it a little bit. No pun intended. Um, but that's the process of we'll use a white wine for an example, we'll use Chardonnay, for example, the process of taking an entire cluster of grapes and pressing the juice off. So um, whole cluster pressing is nice as compared to berry pressing. I mean, they both have pros and cons, right? And again, please ask any questions. And if I'm giving too much information, be like, Kayleen, slow your roll. I'm not gonna be offended. I'm not gonna be offended, I promise. But <clears throat> whole cluster pressing is nice because it's a light pressure. So because you have the stems all up in your business and it's not just grapes, the grapes actually can't get as close to one another because there's stems in the way. Sounds kind of weird. But what this ends up doing is creating a very delicate press um, and you get really high acidity. So um, we talked in one of the evenings of Enology episodes, I believe about structure and function. If you go back and look at that one, it's on Nexus. Um, but part of the structure of a wine is the acid profile. And if you want to retain really high acidity, which can be really lovely, like some high acid wines are just be freaking beautiful. Um, you might consider doing a whole cluster press. And so if you get your grapes in and your, your titratable acidity is really high and your pH is low and it already is rocking and you want to keep it that way, and we'll talk about malolactic fermentation later, but um, um, you may consider doing a whole cluster press. Keep in mind, time-wise, it blows because you can fit in half as much fruit as you could if you destemmed it. So, and oftentimes, um, if you're working in a winery, and this is, I'm, I'm so tired some days, but um, during harvest, you don't just harvest like a couple grapes, right? You, you know, in a small to medium sized winery, you harvest anywhere from two tons to like 15, 20 tons in a day. That's a little extreme, but like, you know, two to 10 tons, two to 12 tons isn't uncommon. And so you have to handle all that fruit in a day. And so you have to also consider, do you have staff who can be up until two or three in the morning waiting for the press cycle? Yep. Okay. <laughs> oh man, on that thought. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have wine? Is it just me? I know we're in a bunch of different time zones, so um, I'm not going to judge you and your wine drinking times and your time zones, but hmm. Hmm. this has also been open for three days and it's still really good. I drink wine really slow. I only have like a glass of night and I got shit to do, right? Okay. So <laughs> fermentation. So fermentation is just the process of going from sugar to ethanol, right? Um, in the most basic sense of the term, um, fermentation is the conversion of sugar into ethanol. Been into Spanish reds lately. Oh, Michelle, girl, I love Spanish reds. And for the price point, they're killer. Rioja Crianza, awesome. Garnacha, which is Grenache's Spanish sibling. Fan-freaking-tastic. Not a bad call. Not a bad call at all. Cava. Oh, I could drink cava all day, but that's sparkling. But still from Spain. Okay. So um, you want to ask yourself, and I'm not going to go into great detail on this because we talked about external factors on fermentation with Brian Farrell back on episode two of Evenings of Enology. So if you're like, how many different ways can you ferment stuff? You can go look at that because there's a bunch of different things that you can do to affect your fermentation. You can put it in vessels that are different. You can temperature it. You can do all kinds of stuff. So, um, but 
we're going to go into different things that happen in fermentation. So as I've been hinting at pretty extremely, you can do a process called whole cluster fermentation. So this is different from whole cluster pressing. So remember, the process of pressing is just getting the juice off of the seeds, the skins, and the stems. So if a winemaker goes to you and says, these grapes were whole cluster pressed. Um, and again, let's say it's a Chardonnay, because that's the you know, that's a nice example of when you would whole cluster press something. Um, as a consumer, you can expect it to be maybe higher acidity. Um, and you can expect it to be um, potentially less oxidized as well. If something is whole cluster, like undergone whole cluster fermentation, so many things. <laughs> so many things can happen. So, um, I, I was taking notes and there were, I mean, it's pretty freaking accurate, but it's, it's a little ridiculous. My notes for whole cluster fermentation just say, put all that shit in a vessel and have a yeast party. It's, it's pretty accurate. Um, you're basically saying, I have looked through all of this fruit. I'm going to put it in whatever vessel it is they want to ferment in or that I can ferment in. And I'm just going to let it go ape shit. Um, and you know, you can handle your, your whole cluster fermentation different ways. You can either do, um, the, in some way, you're probably going to be mixing your fermentation at some point. Um, and so unless you want to have like a super oxidized cap, which I'm sure some people do for some reason, but very commonly you'll do either like punch downs where you physically punch down the cap of the fruit to the bottom and like mix it up a couple times a day. Um, or you'll do what are called pump overs, which is where you have a hose that goes from the bottom of the tank to the top of the tank and the juice from the bottom is heavy enough to push down the cap of the fruit. Um, and this introduces oxidation to the process. But what whole cluster fermentation does um, is because you are have, you have the stem, the seeds and the skins, we mentioned earlier in our Pinot example, that Pinot has a very low tannin profile oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes. And we mentioned that there are tannins in the stems of these clusters. And so you can use that to your advantage and you can add stems into your fermentation and um, uh, get the tannin, the tannin profile from the stems. So another way to do this, so if a winemaker says to you or a winemaking team says to you, this wine was whole cluster fermented. What they mean is they put all the things, they put their clusters, their berries, their stems, their ski seeds, basically everything that came in that one ton bin and they dumped it into whatever vessel it was that they're fermenting in and they just let it go. They either inoculated it with yeast or they left it uninoculated. Um, where you just let the yeast that come in on the grapes or in the winery do the fermentation um, and they fermented it dry. So after you do a whole cluster fermentation, when that, when that fermentation vessel is down to zero grams per liter residual sugar, you still have to press it off. So this is where it gets kind of confusing because we whole cluster pressed our Chardonnay, which increases the acidity profile, reduces oxidation potentially. Um, and then we put it into some other vessel for it to ferment in. Now we're saying we didn't whole cluster, we didn't only whole cluster press, we whole cluster fermented everything together to extract tannin profile from the stems of the berries, most likely. And there's a couple of the reasons you would do a whole cluster fermentation, but just to keep it simple, now you have to whole cluster press that. So you take that entire, um, you take that entire bin and you put it into a press and you press off the wine. And now that wine can go into whatever aging vessel it is that you care about. Um, what kind of yeast would be added to whole cluster fermentation? Good question. So if any time you're going to add yeast, you're going to add Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And there's like a bunch of different kinds of strains. So you can use, I'm going to call it SAC. Sorry. Um, you can use strains of SAC that are better for high alcoholic fermentations. You can use strains of SAC that are um, better for high temperature fermentations, for low temperature fermentations. But it's the same fundamental yeast that you would use to make bread or beer. So good old Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, excuse me. If you do an un uninoculated fermentation, eventually SAC is going to take over. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the yeast that is most tolerable of high alcohol concentrations. And so 
all the other yeast, while, while they're still there in the beginning, they're probably going to die off with the exception of one really annoying yeast called Brett. We talked about Brett a little bit in the faults episode. So if you haven't learned about Brett yet, that's episode, I believe it's episode seven, seven, eight. Anyway, it's, it's on Nexus. <laughs> it's, it's called um, like the faults in our wine or something like that. Um, and we talk about Brett a little bit there. And that's also a yeast that can ferment. Um, but that can ferment in very high alcohol environments because it needs very, very, very little nutrients to survive. It's a pain in the, and it can also thrive on amino acids that, Saccharomyces cerevisiae can't thrive on. So you really want to get that fermentation kind of up and kicking as soon as you can, because if you have a high vigor fermentation, you're going to kind of subside some of those off target um, microbiological organisms and, and, and the party that they want to have, because we don't want to go to their party. Their party is like not enjoyable. We want to go to the Saccharomyces cerevisiae party. So get on that guest list. Okay. So, um, there's a process that I'm just going to kind of very briefly glaze over because it's more towards the end of harvest, but a process of clarification of a wine. So, um, a clarification of a wine basically means how much stuff is in it and in solution. So you can have a wine that's clarified by a process called racking or filtering or fining. So racking is the process of letting gravity do work for you. So you let all the heavy stuff, this, this nexus is going to look really funny because it's like at an angle to me that's like, you can only see me talking to this camera, but what are you going to do? Technology's hard. Hi, nexus. Okay. Um, racking is the process of letting all the heavy particulates that are in wine, like dead yeast cells. Um, I don't know. Any, any, anything that's really heavy, but most commonly dead yeast cells and letting them settle down to the bottom of whatever vessel it is that you're in and then just taking the top off. It's almost like decanting, sort of. That's a process of clarification that you can use if you don't want to do any of these latter two processes, such as fining or filtration. And again, this is a process that, are, that you're going to be using a little bit later in the fermentation or sorry, um, later in the process after you are starting to get wine and you need to actually move it from its temporary fermentation vessel into a more permanent aging vessel. Um, but filtering is exactly what it sounds like. You can take a, a bunch of wine that just got done fermenting, put it over a membrane and heavy stuff that can't fit through the membrane stays on top and all your wine goes through the bottom. Um, you can also use filtration to control a process called malolactic fermentation that we're going to talk a little bit about at the end of this episode, because we kind of got to get some other words out there before malolactic fermentation comes in. But suffice it to say, there are bacteria in your wine um, that can go through the process of converting malic acid into lactic acid. And if you want to avoid that for whatever reason, because malic acid is this green apple-y flavor and lactic acid is this more savory kind of rich flavor, um, you can just filter your whole freaking thing. So the nice thing timing wise about malolactic fermentation and the primary fermentation of sugar into ethanol is that typically you're going to ferment all of your glucose and your fructose down into ethanol and then your malolactic fermentation is going to start. So you can take a dry wine and this isn't always true. Of course, like there's always exceptions in everything. Right. But um, you can take that wine that just got done fermenting its sugar into ethanol and you can filter it. So you can save that malolactic fermentation from happening. And what that does is it retains a green apple flavor. Um, if you don't do that, odds are you're going to go through a secondary malolactic fermentation that we'll talk about in a little bit. So preemptive question, I use filters and chemical analysis. What mesh size is used? Millimeter to micron, about four or five, 0.45 microns. So um, a filter that's just going to get rid of bugs um, or a five, uh, five micron, sorry. Yeah, five micron filter. So you're looking at five microns to 0 0.45, depending on what you're filtering. So, um, and then fining. So fining agents are things that bind to things in, to, in solution and pull them out of solution. This is another way that you can clarify after your, um, your fermentation is done. So a very common example is a thing called bentonite. We talked about bentonite a little bit with uh, Barry Jackson of Equinox Cellars, a sparkling wine uh, producer in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And that's episode one. <laughs> Crazy. I, there's a lot of content on here. Holy biscuits. 
Um, but bentonite is this clay type material that binds to dead leaves and yeast cells and proteins because remember the pH of wine is very, very low. And it is so low that a lot of things in solution that are protein based are gonna be in a protonated state. And this bentonite clay is in a negative state. And so we can pull things out of solution with fining. And you can find with a bunch of other stuff too. It's not just bed tonight, but this is an example that I'm using. But a fining agent is something that will clarify your wine that you just made by pulling stuff out of solution by binding to it directly. So within the realm of clarifying, you may hear a winemaker say, we don't fine or filter. What they're basically saying to you is we don't add stuff to our wine. We let gravity take care of it and then just rack off the top. Um, that's surprising going down to a 4.5 micron. Wow. Wine equals high TDS solution. Oh, what is, oh, turbidity? Seriously, what do you mean by TDS? Um, so if a winemaker says we don't fine or filter, which you, you may hear a lot in like boutique wineries, they're basically saying like, like they're kind of getting on a high horse and that's fine. They're like, we don't add anything. And I feel like I can say this because we don't really find, we don't fine or filter. So like hypocrisy, that name is Kayleen. Um, um, so, and if you don't fine or filter, you probably just rack it off. So, but those wines sometimes can be less than clarified. And you, you may also be in a situation where you don't bottle as much wine to sell because the end or the beginning of your bottling is gonna be a little bit more hazy. Kind of total dissolved solids. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Wine is a very high total dissolved solid solution. Um, yeah, yes, it is dirty. Like, I don't know. If anybody's ever tried to ferment anything like kombucha or beer or anything and there's always that cap of like biological material that is thick in wine super thick okay let's talk about a really weird well these are all really weird right but let's talk about uh, a weird idea that you may or may not have heard has anybody heard of the term carbonic maceration hold on i'll wait ah Kombucha is awesome. Oh, the Scobian kombucha. Yeah, it is really weird. It looks like an alien kind of. Um, oh, seriously, you've heard of carbonic maceration. Awesome. So carbonic maceration is a process that we can use to do a couple of things. It's an intracellular fermentation. So, and it's very hard to do 100%. So, um, a winemaker may choose to do a carbonic maceration for a couple of reasons. They wanna keep their fruit really, really young and we'll talk about why that works and why it's um, beneficial. And if they wanna keep it really floral and light and playful, you might do a carbonic maceration. You may also do a carbonic maceration if you want to um, retain malic acid. So we'll talk about that in a second. But first, carbonic maceration is the process of letting the berries themselves stay completely intact um, and letting the process of, I think it's pyruvic acid. Let me take, check my notes here. Um, yeah, letting the process of malic acid to pyruvate to acetaldehyde to ethanol be your initial fermentation. So in carbonic maceration, you add CO2. And what this does is it makes for an anoxygenic environment. So anaerobic environment. And it's typically gonna be cold and not, not cold, it's gonna be like, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but whatever. Um, it's going to be in a situation where yeast can't start fermenting. Why can't yeast start fermenting? Because you haven't released any juice for them to start fermenting. So the yeast are, this is like a spatial thing. So if you're doing carbonic maceration, all of your berries are still intact, which is why I say it's very hard to do. And we'll talk about the practical limitations of this in a hot second. Seriously, no pun intended because it's kind of cold. But um, you'll have these fully intact berries and you're going to force them to go through an anaerobic process to create ethanol by breaking down their malic acid. So this does two things. If you want your wine to not undergo a malolactic fermentation, whereby you convert malic acid into lactic acid and get this more kind of savory profile, you can force a carbonic maceration where you add CO2 into your vessel and you force it to go through the process of malic acid to ethanol. 
you're immediately dropping your malic acid concentration so that when you actually start your real fermentation of sugar into ethanol with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, your initial malic acid concentration is lower, which means your final, if you go through your malolactic fermentation of lactic acid is also gonna be lower. Did I lose anybody? Cool, okay. <laughs> Little hearts are super helpful. Like I know when I'm like losing people or not losing people. Um, and you can typically only go to about like 2% alcohol by volume with this process. So um, this is a very common process in the Beaujolais region of France with the varietal called Gamay. Um, and this is a another, another cool, you know, thing that causes, that can happen in carbonic maceration is the polyphenols that are in the skin of the grape will go from the skin of the grape um, into the flesh of the grape as well, um, which is kind of cool. And it also liberates extra amino acids because your cells in the grape are basically like, shit, we've got nothing. We are anaerobic. I don't know how we're going to get any energy. And so they start releasing more amino acids. So this also ups your nutrient potential when you actually start fermentation as well. So um, another thing you can measure is uh, your total nitrogen content in wines or in pre-wines, you know, juice, whatever you want to call it. Um, and if that number is low and you have a varietal that you think is potentially beneficial to undergo carbonic maceration. And again, this is a thing that you're not going to typically see outside of the Beaujolais region of France or with very um, niche producers, but it's pretty freaking cool. Um, and another really interesting thing about carbonic maceration is the ethanol that you, you create can actually esterify. And I don't know if there's any chemists in here. If you're a chemist, like wave your hand, raise your hand, like whoop, whoop, I'm a chemist. Um, esterifying ethanol will create a slew of compounds depending on how you esterify it. So esters give rise to smell. And so one of the characteristics of wines that have undergone carbonic maceration are very unique volatile profiles. And so um, an example is ethyl cinnamate. So ethyl cinnamate is the comp one of the compounds that gives rise to like a strawberry and raspberry aroma. So I mentioned earlier that you'll typically see carbonic maceration happening in the Beaujolais region of France with a varietal called Gamay. Gamay is a lot like Pinot in the sense that it has a very thin skin um, and it's kind of a to work with. So carbonic maceration um, not only pulls some polyphenols from the skins into the flesh, it also helps create these really fruity, lovely profiles. Um, and these youngs are, these youngs, these wines are great young. They're beautiful, they're fresh, they're bright. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a night in November called Beaujolais Nouveau. I don't know if anybody's heard of Beaujolais Nouveau night, um, but it's a nice, it's an awesome night for the wine industry because um, you are probably wrapping up harvest a little bit and you can like finally have a life again. Um, but Beaujolais Nouveau, Beaujolais comes in early in the season and they go through carbonic maceration, ferment it dry, bottle it. It's a very young wine, um, but it's beautiful. Um, another compound that you can get from carbonic maceration is benzaldehydes. Um, benzaldehydes give rise to this kind of cherry kind of kirsch flavor. Um, again, fruity, young, vibrant. Um, and as a winemaker, you could also decide to do that at harvest. Um, carbonic maceration is one of those things that you're going to typically be really focusing on if you are a winemaker that does carbonic maceration. It's very uncommon for, you know, your everyday winemaker or winemaking team to undergo carbonic maceration. It's typically going to be something that you're really good at. You've been doing it for a long freaking time. Um, and you're, you're probably going to do it on very thin skinned red varietals. Again, Gamay being like the textbook example. So that's harvest guys. That's all the things you can do. Well, all the things that is, that is a lie. Um, that's some of the stuff that you can do to grapes when they come in at harvest and some of the decisions you have to make starting from in the vineyard pick date based on, you know, primarily pH, titratable acidity and bricks levels all the way through what the heck am I going to do with this fruit and how many options do I possibly have? There's a lot of options and they definitely affect how you as a consumer enjoy your wine. So if the next time you're at a winery um, and you know, you have the ability to talk to somebody be like, Hey, how do you treat your grapes when they come in? Do you, do you de-stem? 
do you sort on a sorting table? Do you sort in the vineyard? Um, do you drop your fruit halfway through? Do you whole cluster press? Because you know what that means now. It means physically putting all of the clusters into the press and straining it with pressure to get juice out. Do you whole cluster ferment? Which now you know means taking all of the berries and the stems and the ske skeeds, skins and the seeds and putting it in a vat and letting it party. Do you do carbonic maceration where you, you let a a pre-alcoholic ferment, sorry, you let a, uh, a pre-yeast fermentation happen in the actual berry itself, which drops malic acid concentration because it forces the conversion of malic acid into ethanol. And it also creates these really cool, like off, you know, not off, these really cool volatiles, you know, such as esterification reactions and stuff. Um, these are all questions that you can now ask your winemakers and figure out if you like or not. Because some lady on the internet sitting on her couch by herself on a Tuesday night told you about them. So yeah. Oh, also, uh, I won't be here next week for the last episode. It's gonna have to be postponed. Uh, apparently, I have to get my wisdom teeth pulled. Really not looking forward to this. Um, and I'm getting them pulled next Tuesday, like next Tuesday morning. And so um, as amusing as I'm sure it would be to have me like very, very high and like swollen up like a chipmunk trying to talk about wine. I think it's also probably a really bad idea. So, <laughs> which also probably means that I won't be able to drink wine from my last episode, which is kind of a buzzkill because I don't think you can drink for like a couple of weeks or something I heard. I don't know. So don't join me next week for Evening Zoonology because I won't be there. Um, but maybe we can catch up the next week, you know, and we can talk about wine again. It'd be super cute, chipmunk wine. Yeah, I um, there's like a fine line between cute and really annoying. And I think I would definitely cross that line. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess with that being said, thanks for hanging out. I really appreciate all your questions. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. And we'll talk about wine then. And if you have any advice on um, dentistry and wisdom teeth that aren't terrifying, you can feel free to send me um, a message. My personal handle is C A I M A R I S O N. It's K Marison, Kayleen Marie Bryson. And right now it's basically flooded with dental things and politics and wine. So that's on my brain right now. So uh, I'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, oh, thank you, CSA. Awesome. I'm glad you had a good time. I had a good time too. Have a good night. Good night, Nexus. <laughs>